talk a little bit about this book. Welcome to this special edition of In Your Community. I am joined here in studio with uh, Lloyd Mincer Interval Home Society CEO, Angela Brooks Trotzik. Thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Um, so I want to start off with, um, for anyone who may not be aware, what is the Interval Home and kind of how it got started? Because it's a pretty interesting story. Yeah, so the Interval Home got started, I would say the, the seed was planted in the boat 1979. And um, it started with a lady, um, Marge Natras. She's a long time um, community member. It was her and another lady, Dolores Cummine, that actually started in another group of um, concerned citizens. But um, it started when Marge actually saw a lady. Um, she was driving down the highway and saw a lady that had no shoes on and, and was in um, obvious distress and, and needed some help. So Marge pulled her over and had told the story that she had just been um, assaulted or uh, by her partner and uh, had nowhere to go. And so going through that process with this person, Marge realized there was nowhere for this person to go and that Lloyd Minster needed somewhere for people in need to go. So that's kind of how the idea started. And it was um, them, those two ladies and a group of concerned citizens that wow. built the, got the first shelter in Lloyd Minster started, which the shelter opened in 1980. Wow, so it's a, it's definitely has some history here in the city. Yeah. Um, so uh, Alberta and Saskatchewan, unfortunately, have some of the highest rates of uh, domestic abuse um, mm -hmm. throughout the country. So I want to talk about how does the interval come to not only help women and children in those situations that are maybe currently in those situations, but how are you guys kind of, with your programs, working towards hopefully a future without family yeah. violence? So we offer many different services through the society. So of course, first we have our emergency shelter, which takes care of the immediate crisis need, um, as well as our transitional housing program, which takes, a, takes care of more of a long-term kind of shelter need. They can stay with us for up to a year um, there. And then we have our community outreach program, which works with women who may still currently be in crisis or have transitioned out of crisis and are trying to build stability in their lives. Um, and then we have, of course, our youth center, which works with the youth demographic and is trying to build um, through the youth and working with them to build healthy um, traits and skills and relationships in their lives. And then we also have our child wellness program which uh, works with um, the preschool and, and children age or the young child age um, right. to, to kind of work with getting them some skills as well and teaching them about what violence is and, and what healthy relationships are. So a little bit of more being uh, proactive. Yes, yeah, exactly. So Model for yeah, sure. for sure. Yeah. Um, so I want to talk about the process um, when someone does uh, need to come to the interval, um, either just for your program services or just or for shelter needs. Mm -hmm. So um, maybe people think that you know they just go to the shelter for a week and then you know they're good to go, but that's not the case. It is yeah. a long, lengthy process. So can you walk us through kind of what that process is? Yeah. So we have a 24-hour crisis line, which takes all um, intakes for our emergency shelter. So that's typically where people call regardless if they want programming information or want to come into shelter. But I, I guess I'll focus on what it looks like for somebody coming into shelter. Um, so the phone call comes in. They speak with our staff and it's determined whether um, they're, they're in, what their needs are and if they would like to come into shelter. And so at that point it's determined what we do, whether or not we have room in our shelter. Um, so if there is room in our shelter, they, the, the person is either assisted to come into shelter by us going to pick them up or taxis or, or whatever the case may be, or if they have their own transportation, then they can come in that way. Um, unfortunately, we can't um, you know, accommodate everybody sure. that calls, which I mean is an unfortunate reality for us right now. Um, and in that case, we actually work with the person to find alternative safe shelter for them. So we assess their safety needs with them. Um, you know, determine if they're safe to be where they're at or if they need to go to another shelter in another location. Mm -hmm. um, you know, help assist get them to other, you know, safe location and shelters wherever, um, or sh not shelters, but other safe locations right. um, where they can be safe until they can come into shelter. So it really kind of just depends on what the need is. Mm -hmm. um, if they're looking for outreach services, then we would um, redirect them directly to our outreach services. But really the crisis line is kind of the main point of contact for people. Um, so uh, you talked a little bit about um, you know working with other organizations in case you guys don't have the room. Mm -hmm. um, so I want to talk about uh, 
you know, who you work with. So obviously just over um, almost two years ago, you've amalgamated with the uh, yep. Lloydminster Youth Center. And then recently we've seen you partner with the SPCA to, you know, promote, you know, family violence does have an impact on animals. Yeah. And then recently, uh, uh, the um, elder abuse, yeah. right? That was a big mm -hmm. thing. So can you talk about those relationships and why they're so important for yeah. you guys to work together? Yeah, absolutely. That's a good question. Um, the easy answer is that, you know, you do more good together than they do than you do apart. And, and that's because you pool your resources. So the interval home can't be everything to everybody and know everything about everything. So we, of course, need to bring in um, help and resources and expertise in other areas. And, and we really do see positive of impact when we do that. Um, mm -hmm. It's better for the clients that need our help um, when we can, you know, phone up somebody um, at the SPCA to make sure that their pets are taken care of so that they come can come into shelter, for example. Um, you know, there's we have many different relationships in the community as well to make sure that our clients' needs are met, of course, because like, like I said, we can't be everything to everybody. We know about domestic violence mm -hmm. and homelessness and youth issues, um, but we certainly need help in making the biggest difference for the clients in that way. Exactly. Um, so we'll leave it at that for now. Uh, when we come back, we are going to be talking with uh, Midwest Victim Services and kind of how they come into play with that as well. So stay with us. We'll be right back. back to In Your Community. I am now joined with uh, Jennifer Hoberg from pro er, with the Program Coordinator at Midwest Victim Services. So thank you so much for joining me and sitting down today. Thank you for having thank me. Thank you. So I want to start off with what is Midwest Victim Services? What is that you do? Uh, Midwest Victim Services is a police-based victim services program. We work in partnership with the RCMP to ensure victims of crime and traumatic events have the support that they need to go through uh, whatever it is they may be going through at that time. Uh, we wear a number of different hats. Um, of course, we provide 24 hour a day, seven day a week support by RCMP call out. Um, we're there to assist for things like um, next of kin notifications. So if someone has died um, and the police are um, tasked with notifying the family of that death, we would go with them to support the family. Um, any type of um, fatality, mo uh, fatal motor vehicle collisions, suicides, homicides, um, the police will call us in to assist any loved ones that uh, might be needing some support. Um, when uh, we have a referral for a victim of a crime, we are there to provide information on the investigative process, court process, um, provide them with updates on their files. So has someone been charged? If so, what are the conditions of their release? Um, when is court? We're calling our victims with regular court updates, mm -hmm. making sure that they're aware of their rights within the criminal justice process as well. Um, for example, the right to submit a victim impact statement to the court and uh, fill out other um, applications for financial benefits, victims compensation, things like that. Uh, we also refer people to other agencies in our community that are better able to support them more long term. And uh, we also provide court support. So we do court orientation with victims and witnesses that are required to testify at a trial. And we also go with them if they would like that support in the courtroom. Mm -hmm. So before we get into kind of how you work with the Interval Home here in Lloydminster, I wanna talk about why is a program like what you guys do so integral in our community? Well, I think that when someone has been a victim of a crime, it, it turns their entire world upside down, regardless of the type of crime, whether it be fraud or a home invasion, uh, robbery, break and enter, theft of a vehicle. Uh, we're seeing a lot of that lately. Um, you know, there's lots of different um, obstacles that that victim might face financially, emotionally. And uh, so that's kind of why we're there to help them problem solve and to be an emotional support as well. Um, a lot of times our work with clients is simply just letting them vent and talk about what they had to go through. And of course, um, you know, sometimes people need extra help in moving forward in their journey mm -hmm. and, and healing. So we, we try our best to, to be that support for them. Yeah, so you're kind of letting them know they don't have to do it alone. Absolutely. Right? Um, so I want to talk about, uh, you work with the RCMP obviously very closely, you work in the detachment. So how important is that relationship? 
Um, it's, I think, very important. Uh, we have a really great relationship with all of the RCMP um, detachments that we work with. Our, our main office, of course, is in Lloydminster, but we also um, provide services for Onion Lake Detachment, Maidstone de Detachment, St. Walberg, Glaslin, and Turtleford. So we cover a very large area. Um, but, you know, the police have a very um, difficult job. <laughs> uh, of course, when a crime is reported, their, you know, their job is to get the facts and to investigate. And if, uh, if someone is identified um, to charge that person and apprehend the perpetrator, they don't always have the time to spend uh, focused on the victim's needs and what, mm -hmm. what other things may be going on for that person. And so that's kind of where they rely on us to kind of be that, um, that warmer support, so to speak, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, I want to talk about uh, the work that you guys kind of do with the Interval Home. Obviously, you have a great relationship with them, um, but you offer different uh, supports and services. So I want to talk about um, why is that relationship with um, other organizations like the Interval Home in our community so important? Well, I think when you're trying to help people, uh, regardless of the type of crime, um, each agency that's providing services in the community for victims um, ha has to understand that we can't work in a vacuum and expect that we're going to be able to help people completely. Um, we each play a, a, a different role and can offer different types of support. And so I think that recognizing that I is really important. Um, you know, with, with victim services, of course, we don't have the financial means to help people with shelter or um, basic needs. Mm -hmm. And so we rely on places like the Interval Home to help our clients yeah. in ways that we can't. Exactly. Mm -hmm. um, and I just want to talk about um, you do, um, you have employees, but you're also very uh, volunteer based as well. So can you talk about um, how important are the volunteers to your services and how does one maybe get involved? Well, as I said, uh, we cover a very large area, and right now we only have funding for three paid staff. So, of course, it's Im an impossible task to try to take that all on on our own. Um, and we are 24 hours a day, seven days a week as well, so we always have somebody that has the on-call phone in the after hours, weekends, on, and holidays. And that's where our wonderful team of volunteers really uh, steps up to the plate. Right now we have nine volunteers spread out wow. within our communities. Um, most of them are here in Lloydminster. And they are just, they're family, really. Mm -hmm. um, they, all of them have huge hearts and are just so always willing to help out when, when need be. Um, when they are CMP call, whether it be two in the morning or eight at night, um, they're the ones that are going out there and providing that support to, to victims. So there's no way that um, the small number of staff that we have would be capable of doing that on our own. So we're very grateful for, for the team we do have. Of course, we are still looking for volunteers, particularly mm -hmm. in our rural detachment areas. It's been harder to find people out there. And so, um, you know, if there's anyone that's in the Onion Lake, Turtleford or Maidstone area that has an interest in volunteering, we would love to, uh, to talk with them. If they stopped by the Lloydminster RCMP detachment and just asked uh, to speak with Victim Services, one of my staff would be happy to provide them with an application package. Uh, there is a bit of a process mm -hmm. involved. Um, all of our staff and volunteers are RCMP security cleared. So we provide them with a stack of paperwork yeah. that they need to fill out and uh, there's background checks that are right. done. It's quite intensive. And um, once they've passed that security clearance, then we start the training stage. and we get them off and running. Great. Well, I want to thank you so much for uh, taking the time to sit down with me and giving us some insight into uh, what goes on at Midwest Victim Services. So thank you so much. Again, this was Jennifer Hoberg with uh, Program Coordinator with Midwest Victim Services. We'll be right back. Welcome back, everyone. We are back with um, Angela Brooks Trotzik, CEO at the Lloydminster Interval Home. Thank you again for joining me. Um, so we just spoke with uh, Jennifer from Midwest Victim Services, and um, obviously you guys work closely together, um, do different things, but can definitely help each other. So from the Interval um, perspective, how in crucial is you know that organization in our community, mm -hmm. and then their work that you guys do together? 
Yeah, well, from, from our perspective, Midwest Victim Services is, is a, a much needed resource in our community and in particular to our, to our clients. I mean, um, abuse and, and violence, it's a criminal activity, right? So in the event that there's charges laid in, in one of our clients' um, cases, um, we do work with victim services to, to help um, with that client, you know, prepare them for court, help them understand the, the process of court and, and the justice system, help liaise with the RCMP um, officer in charge of their case, and of course emotional support. Okay. So um, a lot of times that victim services is called out um, right on the scene when, when there's a um, incident. So you know, sometimes there our clients are meeting victim services before they even meet us. So, in the, in those cases, you know, victim services would be putting a referral into the interval home, and because that relationship already exists, um, it, it's an easier transition because they know who we are and and we know who they are. So, and and the working relationship is great. Awesome. Um, so I want to touch a little bit about you said um, the mental aspect, mm -hmm. and Jennifer really spoke to sometimes these people just need to vent. So how how important is that to be able to kind of release those emotions when you are going through such a traumatic time. Yeah, absolutely. I think the the more that we're able to talk about whatever is going on for us, so someone in crisis needs to tell their story. That's part of the process of, of starting to heal is being able to tell your story. And um, that's our job is to just allow them to tell their story without judgment and without critique or, um, you know, questioning. It's just allowing them to tell their story as they see it and then being able to move into, you know, providing other support, so practical support, other emotional support and, and safe shelter. So mm -hmm. absolutely telling your story is, is an important part of that. Great. Um, so obviously we've touched a lot on, you know, your programming and, you know, the shelter. So I want to talk about the store because the store is a big part of um, what you guys do and you have amazing volunteers there all the time. Mm -hmm. um, so I want to talk about you know, how does the store come into play? Because it's not just for, you know, people who are shopping on a budget, you know, need to come in. But, you know, a lot of those items do go back to the shelter and the women and children in care. Yeah. So can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah. So first and foremost, our store is actually to collect goods um, for our clients. So um, we're not in business just to be a secondhand store. It's a community depot for people to drop off donations that go to people in need. So first and foremost, that's what we're there for. And, and we're able to provide our families with you know startup kits beds furniture clothing because um, a lot of times they come to us with nothing you know they've had to leave what they had behind and, and come into shelter and and when they're starting up you know new homes and starting over again it's nice to be able to to give them what they need free of charge and that's first and foremost what we do at the store of course secondly um, whatever is left over is sold back to the community mm -hmm. with the funds going directly into operations and programming so um, I mean without the interval store and the volunteers that that help us operate it we would have a very different um, set of services at the Lloydminster interval home which which I mean we wouldn't have as much um, services to offer the community as we do exactly and uh, just touching back on the volunteers they're they're so amazing over at the store yeah. if you haven't been down to the uh, store you definitely need to go and I found some great items there we <laughs> did a shopping segment there is some really great finds but going back to the volunteers I mean, these people dedicate yeah. so much time. So, yeah. you know, how crucial are those volunteers? Yeah. I mean, my goodness, when you look at the manpower that they um, put in on a daily basis, I think the last time I looked at the calculations, each of them are, are working roughly 20 hours a month, wow. or the, the core volunteers that are there um, day in, day out. Because, I mean, obviously we have people that can give many hours during a week and, and some people that can give a few hours a month kind of thing. So on average, our volunteers are providing about 20 hours a week of service, which is pretty like incredible. part-time job. It is, and, and that's kind of what I showed it to them. It's like a part-time job. And the amount of um, money that that saves us, and it's not, I don't say that to make it about the money, mm -hmm. but I say that to, to kind of show the impact of what our volunteers are able to do and of course you know most of them are, are through the store of course because that does take quite a lot of operational manpower to 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 run the store um, but we do also have volunteers with our child's program and our mentorship program and grocery shopping and and so there's many ways that our volunteers do give to us but without them we would not be as um, 
successful as we are in being able to provide services to the community. Yeah, definitely. And um, are you guys always looking for volunteers? Absolutely. Yeah, we are always looking for volunteers. And, um, you know, I think one of the biggest misconceptions is that maybe they, they think they don't have you know, a skill or something to offer, but um, no, if you have some time and you're willing to give back, you know, we can come and talk to us and, and we'll figure something out for sure. Great. Um, okay, so we'll leave it there and we will come back and kind of talk about what's coming up for you guys. All right, so stay, stick with us and we will be right back. Welcome back to In Your Communities Special Edition. I'm uh, joined again, once again with Angela Brooks Trotzik, CEO at the Lloydminster Interval Home Society. Um, so you guys are a nonprofit, so um, a lot of what you do is fundraising and you know trying to get that money in there. So because it, these programs are very integral in our community. So um, your biggest, one of your biggest events is the Children's Ball, which yeah. you guys had in May. It was, this year was Aladdin theme. Mm -hmm. So how was it? Oh, it was it was really get great again this year. It was completely sold out. Great. So, I mean, there was lots of children, lots of parents, and lots of fun um, to be had. So, um, it's just really a neat event. I mean, if you haven't, if people haven't been able to check it out, it really is worth checking out. The kids have an amazing time. The parents have an amazing time, and we were able to raise money for a new shelter, which Ex we're working towards. Exactly. So. so yeah. um, Currently, you said you have 21 beds, correct? Yes, right? yeah. And so you would like to see that expanded? Yeah, our plan is to, um, when we're able to, to build, but the goal right now is to co-locate an emergency shelter in our second stage in one building and increase our bed capacity from 21 to 34 to 38 in our emergency shelter and from five to about 10 units in our second stage, so. Yeah. Yeah. And obviously, the numbers that we see, that's obviously a very crucial part, uh, yeah, something absolutely. we need. Yeah. Um, so uh, I want to talk about kind of the future, like what's what's coming up for you guys. I know obviously family um, uh, violence prevention month is a big yeah. one, so in yeah. November. Yeah, so November is, I hate to talk about the winter already, I we're know. just getting <laughs> some nice weather, but family violence prevention month in November is coming up. And so we'll be doing our Red Silhouette program again this year, but this year we'll, we're also planning a different event. Um, I don't have a lot of details to share but um, we will be doing something a little bit different in the in the community trying to engage the community in discussion around um, family violence and how we can each do a part to try to to minimize it so mm -hmm. that'll be coming up in November great and I actually just want to touch back on the red silhouettes they um, you told me a story about a man who says well that doesn't happen here yeah. so it just goes yeah. to show that that conversation is important absolutely and, yeah, yeah and so those red silhouettes are such yeah. uh, an impactful statement, I feel absolutely, like. Yeah. Absolutely, absolutely. All right, well, I really want to thank you for taking the time to sit down yeah. with me. I know you're a busy woman, um, and thank you so much for all the work you do in our community. Awesome. So, appreciate yeah. it. Well, thank, thank you so you. much. Thank you. Thank you so much for tuning in to our 30-minute uh, edition of In Your Community. Thank you so much for watching.